Good afternoon, everyone. I hope I mean, we have really been enjoying the uh, conference. Uh, as you have on the program, we now have the keynote uh, uh, speech, which will be given by His Highness the Emir of Kano, uh, who will be introduced later by Professor Stephen Chan. My duty now is just to introduce the chair, uh, Professor Stephen Chan, who will then come to introduce to us the Emir before he delivers his speech. Uh, Stephen Chan is Professor of World Politics in the Department of Politics and International Studies here at SOAS. Uh, he was awarded the OBE in 2010 for services to Africa and higher education. And in the same year, Stephen was named the International Studies Association Eminent Scholar in Global Development. Stephen has been at SOAS for uh, quite uh, some time. He was the Foundation Dean of Law and Social Sciences here at SOAS, and he has also held named chairs around the world. Most recently, the Koran Adenu uh, uh, Stifton Chair of Academic Excellence at uh, Brzeite University, and the George Soros Chair in Public Policy at Central European University. You know, a lot of the time, he, Stephen intimidates me a lot. He, <laughs> yes, he has published 32 books, you know, 32 authored books. Uh, and having begun his career as an international civil servant, he continues to be seconded to diplomatic initiatives uh, in Africa and the Middle East. He helped pioneer modern electoral observation at the 1980 independence elections of uh, Zimbabwe. Uh, Stephen uh, inspires most of us here at SOAS with his knowledge on, on Africa. So it's a great honor for me introducing him. And I want to invite um, Stephen, as chair of uh, uh, this keynote address, to introduce the Emmy of Ghana. Thank you, Stephen. Well, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of SOAS and the Center for African Studies, may I very much welcome you and welcome His Highness, uh, the Emir of Kano. Uh, there are some people in the world who inspire me, and the Emir of Kano is one of those people. It's very rare for us to be able to host somebody who traverses different worlds and is able to do so in a way that looks to a future which is meaningful and hopeful, not only for Nigeria, but for the wider region of West Africa, and I think for international cooperation way beyond the continent of Africa. I was delighted when he, as the governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, was named by Bankers Magazine as the Africa and Global Central Bank Governor of the Year. I think this was an honor that was extremely well deserved. The amount of fiscal rigor that he tried to bring to Nigerian finances and economics was really quite astounding. And of course, we're all very familiar with the headlines that followed his exposure of irregular practice, what we might loosely call corrupt practices, in the body politic and public life in Nigeria. This very, very courageous stand is something which I think has been remarked upon as a turning point in public life in Nigeria and a way towards a future of far greater probity than has been present up till now. So he's a man of great technocratic and economic accomplishments, following upon his early development as an economics student, master's degree, uh, very, very much involved in academic life in his early career before turning to banking. He rose through the banking sector until he became the governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria. And upon being uh, let us say, required to relinquish that position, uh, he took up, he was able to take up the emirship of Kano. In this particular position, he's brought to a certain frontline position a combination of sagely knowledge and modern knowledge of what the country and northern Nigeria require for the future. An Islamic scholar who trained in Khartoum on top of his learnings in economics, He's been able to discourse wisely and progressively on Sharia and what it means in a modern context, in modern cultural contexts, and how an enlightened Islam can take a path forward in an engagement 
with modernity. He has defended minority groups. He has defended Sufi Islamic groups. Uh, for that, uh, Boko Haram has put a price on his head. He has defended the rights of women. He has been in many, many respects, far too many to enumerate today, that wonderful crossover between someone who's traditionally learned, learned in the modern ways of global finance, learned and conscious of the need for a new future based on new foundations. So it's my great pleasure to invite my inspiration to give a keynote on imagining Africa's future, language, culture, governance, development. Please join with me to welcome the Emir of Kano. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Chair. When I was first asked to speak on this conference and asked to speak about Africa and culture and governance and development, I, I did protest. Obviously, no one can talk about Africa in that way. Uh, I imagine there'll be many papers on different parts of Africa and different um, periods of history, but it's extremely difficult uh, to speak about Africa in, in, in that manner uh, in, in, in half an hour now. Uh, then uh, Professor Baderin very kindly reduced that to Nigeria, uh, which had to be even more problematic. How do you speak about Nigerian culture? You know? um, so um, I have an old habit that I built when I was in the central bank, which is whenever I'm invited for these functions, I try to write a paper that is politically correct. Um, that I can always hold up and say this was what I presented. And then I go ahead and say what I want to say, which may or may not be uh, <laughs> uh, consistent with, with everything, uh, with everything in the paper. Um, but, so there is a paper around this topic, um, talking about Nigeria, pre-colonial, colonial, post-colonial, post talking about um, the colonial economy, as you would expect, talking about some of the tensions in the country, the military coups and so on. But I don't think I was invited here uh, as an academic. Uh, I thought, so I will t I'll play the role of the AMA dealing with um, real issues of culture and development and some of the thoughts I have around that area. And hopefully uh, some of the things I will say will go into the theme of this conference. When you think of Nigeria, as one country, uh, when you talk about these subjects, you, you end up with a great deal of difficulty. I mean, take simple developmental indices or poverty indices. Uh, one of the key indicators of um, development is the measure of poverty. And if you looked at headline numbers, you'd find that 46% of Nigerians are living below uh, the poverty line based on UNDP figures for 2015. However, when you break that down, you find that only 20% of Nigerians in the Southwest are living below poverty, while 80% of Nigerians in the Northwest are living below poverty. So, so clearly, even in terms of poverty or development, you can't speak of Nigeria. The priorities um, and the problems faced by Lagos are very, very different from those faced by Kano or Meduguri or Sokoto. And that's why some of the issues that come up uh, in some parts of the country don't seem to be relevant to other parts of the country. Um, perhaps the best way to begin this is to talk about the kind of transition I had from being a governor of Central Bank to an Emir, where I moved from a situation where I dealt with numbers and statistics to a situation where I was dealing with the human beings behind those numbers and beginning to understand what those numbers meant and then trying to think through how, apart from the whole theoretical, ideological debates we have about socialism and capitalism and globalization, how in real terms um, we need to understand the real underlying fundamental causes of the problems that we face. Uh, I always give this example, and, and I'll try this time to go through it uh, without any kind of emotions, but it, it tells. It's, it's for me a telling example 
of the difference between looking at a statistic and looking at a human being. Um, in the central bank, we re reeled off these numbers about the number of Nigerians living on less than $1 a day. And I tell people I never knew what it meant to live on less than $1 a day until I became the emir. You know, and one instance I give um, is what I still consider perhaps the saddest day in my life, where, because usually when I sit in court, people come, some have problems with their husbands, some have problems with their wives, some have issues with their neighbors, some have land issues, uh, some need help with drugs. And while sitting there, I heard this loud scream. And I sent someone to find out what it was. And there was this woman who had walked across from the hospital, across from the palace, and among a group of women with their children. And while waiting for her turn to see the Amir, her baby had died. And the baby died because she did not have 3,000 naira for drugs. That's less than $10. And there were eight too many in line on that day, and all of them needed like 20,000 naira. So, I mean, this is a country where people, or a part of the country, where a woman would lose her baby because she cannot buy drugs of $5 or $10. That is what it means to live on less than $1 a day. Now, it radically changes and transforms one's view of life, of development, of poverty. And you begin to look at how we have defined our development in terms of trying to look very much like what you call the developed world. So you, you go to Abuja and you've got all these um, beautiful bridges, and even in Cairo, beautiful bridges, overhead bridges, you know, uh, beautiful roads, street lights, um, skyscrapers, and we see that as development. When in fact, um, th the vast majority of people who are walking on those streets are hungry and they're sick and uh, they've, they've got nothing to do. And for a fraction uh, of, of those resources, you could change the lives of people. And, and I always give this story of um, of a poor Nigerian man from Kogi State who was invited for a town hall meeting with the former president of the World Bank in Abuja. And so after the, when they were all asked to speak, this gentleman put up his hand. And you know, he made this, we all laughed when he made this statement, but it was so profound. He said, look, um, in my village, um, there's a river that separates me from the main road. And during the rainy season, I can't come out. Uh, the only reason I'm able to make it to Abuja was this was dry, dry season, so I could walk across the stream and get um, a car, get, get a bus to come to Abuja. But what surprises me is I came to Abuja and I saw all these bridges, and there's no water, there's no river in Abuja. <laughs> you know, and it's it's fundamental in a sense. You know, you, you, we we think we are developed because Abuja looks like begins to look like London, you know, when in fact for 80, 90 percent of the population, you need small bridges that would just give them access to cities, you know, get their farm produce to the market, get them to hospital in case of emergency, and they don't have it. So, um, again, um, I would say, Professor Badarin, that talking about Nigeria is a bit too much for me. Okay, but I'd like to share some of my thoughts about some of the interrelations between what you might call culture and development in the part of the country that I happen to be engaged uh, with on a daily basis um, now. Now, I've been involved in these debates at a theoretical level for decades. I've been involved in these debates around uh, Islam and modernity, around negotiating our interpretations uh, of Islam about um, the place of a Muslim community in a multi-religious um, or secular, secular state. Um, but these tensions, okay, and these issues, and these interpretations um, have profound impact 
from a developmental perspective in a manner in which I had not considered before. So having studied economics and having studied Islamic law, I now find myself in a role where I can actually, and I can actually begin to see how certain archaic or wrong or um, misunderstood uh, perceptions or interpretations of Islam have actually led to economic underdevelopment. Now it sounds strange and very controversial, it's a controversial thesis, but um, so one of the first lessons we learn in economics obviously is, uh, is Malthus and the whole issue of population and how um, you continue to increase the labor uh, force on a limited uh, amount of land or resources and you end up with diminishing marginal productivity. I call it just diminishing margins or the law of diminishing because everything goes down. Now, take Nigeria in 1960. The amount of land available to a rural dweller on the average was two hectares. Today it is 0 0.9. And in the next decade or two, it will be down to 0 0.5. It's a combination of desertification, desalination, erosion, and other environmental issues. But it's also about demographic explosion. And that has led to all sorts of conflicts. We, 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 we hear every day about Fulani herdsmen and their conflicts with grazers and people who, um, ethnicize or give religious colorations to what, by the way, is a problem that has, that's as old as the Old Testament itself. You do it, give them grazing land, you encroach on the land, you're going to have these problems. Um, we have Boko Haram, we have ethnic conflicts, and we're not joining the dots. We, we're not beginning to make a connection between a failure of social policy and the social unrest and the economic uh, problems that we face as a country. So I come from part of the country where, uh, which is a part of the Sahel, uh, which uh, I suppose 500 years ago, 600 years ago, was the richest part of Sub-Saharan Africa, eclipsed later with the discovery of the steamship and colonialism and the coastal cities. Um, so cities like Kano and Katsina and Timbuktu and Gao got eclipsed by Lagos and Accra and Abidjan and so on. But with social structures and um, family structures and social organizations that were formed for wealthy societies, which have not yet understood that the world has changed. Okay, so it's very easy in Kano to see a man who has no uh, employment of any sort and who earns nothing marry three women and have 18, 19 children. And he's very happy to have them roam the streets as what you call al-majri. And it's also very easy to see public officers discussing how they're going to find the money, how they're going to build the schools, how they're going to care for al-majri without anybody ever asking if the father who gave birth to this child had certain responsibilities in the first place and if he should be held responsible for the child that he brought. While the rest of the Muslim world has um, introduced uh, reforms to family law, looked at such things as the age at which girls marry, the issues like child spacing, regulated polygamy, sure that you're able to maintain a family before you have it, child rights. These are issues that are not part of the conversation, or they've just started being part of the conversation in a very difficult manner. Um, in the North, partly because of a culture um, that has been built in which the interpretations of Islam and certain, certain historical social structures have become so conflated that it's very easy uh, to get emotional rather than have a rational um, and, and, um, and proper intellectual conversation. So how did we get here? How did we get to a situation where uh, today, uh, the very large percentage of girl, of girl children in the North 
never complete school. If you take the north, east and northwest of Nigeria, maybe about 10% or less of the adolescent girls read and write. The northeast has um, maternal mortality rates five times the global average. In a state like Zamfara and a state like Yobe, 90% of the population is living in poverty where you have in Kano State alone, three million children who are out of school, and in the North, maybe 15, 16 million statistically out of school. So Nigeria after India has the highest number of out of school children in the world. How did you, we get to a situation where you, one country has become effectively two countries, where you, you would, uh, as I said, um, in a recent speech, which didn't go down well with people, if, if, if the North itself were a country on its own, it probably would be one of the poorest countries in the world. Because we're not looking at the, we're not looking below the headline numbers. Now there are a number of issues that we need to look at. Some of them, um, I think, have not been seriously considered in academic discourse, and I'm hoping that um, institutes like yours would look at the implications of some of the um, events of our history. So if we go back to colonial education policy, and, and, and the works, of course, of people like Tibin Dirana who've uh, seriously um, studied um, education, especially in northern Nigeria, and the policy of the British, um, as far as education was concerned. The, the arrival of Britain and the conquest of the North and turning of the North into a British territory, it came with certain, um, naturally, uh, was accompanied by certain events around policy that have had a long lasting impact on where the North is. The North was unfortunate to have its first three governors come from Sudan, coming straight from a very, very, very bad experience with the Mahdi. Therefore, uh, you know, it's like um, getting um, someone with a strong Islamophobic um, a tendency today to go and rule a Muslim country. So, so first of all, the, the, uh, from Lord Lugard on, the, the principal fear was how do we make sure that we do not reproduce in northern Nigeria the kind of radical Muslim intellectuals that we produce in Egypt and India and the Sudan. And determined not to repeat the mistake of Egypt and the Sudan and India, the British had a policy, one, of keeping as many Northerners illiterate as possible. Two, when you educate them, make sure you educate them to be employees, competent employees of the native authority and obedient servants to the colonial administration. So the policy was explicit. Teach them respect for hierarchy. Teach them the supremacy of the white man. Teach them technical skills, but make sure they do not develop a mind of their own and they do not challenge the system. Northern Nigeria, of all the protectorates of Britain, had the lowest number of schools. We had fewer schools than Ghana. As at 1959, when the first school offering higher school certificate started offering, that was Barrier College, there are already 20 schools offering that in southern Nigeria. At the point of independence, the north had maybe 2,000 elementary schools, while the south had about 9,000. The north had 200,000 children in elementary school, the, north, the south had about 1.2. And this was even before the southern regions started universal free primary education. Nowhere in the British colony did we have the gaps between boys' education and girls' education that we had in northern Nigeria. 
and these gaps were exacerbated by the very nature of British colonial policy. So girls' schools were set up the first, although the boys, the first boys' school was set up in 1910, the first girls' school was set up around 1930. Girls, what were called girls' centers in Kano and Katsina. Those schools aim to teach basic numeracy and literacy, and then personal hygiene, nursing, um, domestic chores that would make, that would produce young ladies that were good wives to the educated boys that were being educated. And these children, these ladies were all children of the nobility of the aristocracy. So these were princesses uh, and, uh, and, and daughters of title holders put in those schools. That decision was a disaster because children of royalty were the ones that tended to get married off early. There was a very high demand for princesses, uh, for people who thought it was a way for upward social mobility. So by the age of 10, 11, every princess would have many suitors. So usually they would be married off very early. And even if they completed the school anyway, the daughters of Amias and the daughters of Qadis and the daughters of Imams never went out to work. There was no financial incentive. They were the ones that practiced perda or gole at the most extreme form, as um, many of you probably, those who've read Aisha Imams' doctorate thesis will be familiar with. So um, girls' schools were set up for those who did not need them or use them. And the Telekawa, the ordinary people, did not send their daughters to school because their experience of the boys' schools had not been very positive. Out of the 3,000 or so uh, boys that had finished elementary schooling uh, by 1945 uh, or so, only 700 got employed in the native <coughs> authority system. All 700 were children of noblemen. So, so the Telekawa who sent their boys to school found that their boys did not have access to native authority jobs. Education was not for them a path for overthrowing the system precisely because the British system of indirect rule uh, was um, based on the, um, on the principle of strengthening the traditional hierarchies so long as those hierarchies remain loyal to uh, the British. Now, I'm a beneficiary of that, I admit so, but, uh, but, but this, is, this is really the logic of, um, of, of colonialism and colonial education. And, and the second thing that the British did, um, largely under the influence, obviously, of Christian missionaries like Miller, was to actively um, devalue and put a stop to um, Islamic education and Arabic education in, in many ways. So, for example, the Ajami script, which was um, nothing but Hausa language written in Arabic characters was uh, basically stopped um, as part of education. And Fisher uh, was quite clear in his documentation that if you allow the use of Arabic characters, then you're promoting the Mohammedan religion. So uh, if, uh, basically, as part of a world in which um, imperialist officers, um, communism in, in the Soviet Union, where there was this whole orchestrated attempt to put a stop to Arabic Islamic civilization, northern Nigeria also uh, suffered that. And, and as Nigerians know, this is something that continued even after, after independence. I, I still have this funny example of a few decades ago where on our currency we've always had a jemi, which is how Sarit Arabic stream that says, ten naira, it says naira goma. If you read Ajami, it's hausa naira goma, naira ashira but it was taken out because we had a central bank governor and a president who thought these were Islamic characters, and they removed them. You know, just Hausa, <laughs> you know, but um, it's, so it's a continuation of, um, of that policy. Now, what is the danger of that? And this, is really, this goes beyond religion. You have a part of the country that for 500 years, 700 years, 800 years, has been part of an Islamic civilization where the levels of education 
in the Islamic sciences have been extremely advanced, you know, comparable to any part of the world. I mean, a young um, child would learn the Quran. After the Quran, he would go to the Makaranchi Ilmi, he would learn fiqh, he would learn grammar, he would learn hadith, he would learn um, jurisprudence. Um, basically, letters were written in Ar Arabic. Arabic was the language of the, of the courts. The AMS communicated with the district in Arabic, and so on. And all of that was given a value of zero. And it's still given a value of zero. Today we say there are three million children out of school in Kano. Maybe out of those three million, at least two million know how to read and write in Arabic. But for all intents and purposes, they are illiterate. There is no certification. The system has no place for them. They have no future in the system. The result is that they end up in the hands of some radical preacher who understands them, who gives value to their education, who radicalizes them, and takes advantage of the resentment they have against the system, and they turn against society. And they come up and say, Western education is haram. And they want to kill you because you've had Western education. And they want to destroy the system, which has no place for them, because it has no value for their education. And as we try to deal with it, with it, yes, we have to deal with a military solution, but no one is thinking beyond killing and jailing and um, basically um, crushing this movement. No one is looking at some of the fundamental issues, and um, one issue being that you cannot just erase 600 years, 700 years of history because of a 60-year interruption by the British. Yes, 60 years of colonialism is important, but 60 years is no reason to completely obliterate 500 years. And it's difficult, and it's impossible to do it. And it will keep coming back. You can't, Northern Nigeria was not a clean slate. It was not a place without a history. It was not a place without a, a culture, without a tradition, and there has to be a way of um, mainstreaming that history and that civilization into this rich um, uh, country that we have. And this is something that, frankly, I never really thought about very deeply until I came to this role and, and, and realized all the frustrations that people feel. When, when you see someone who's memorized the Quran, who studies Arabic, who who is very fluent in Arabic, who knows jurisprudence, who knows Islamic legal theory, and for all intents and purposes, he's an illiterate. He doesn't have an opportunity. Whereas in a previous system, he would be a qadi, he would be an imam, he would be uh, an advisor to, in, the court, in the court of the emir. And whereas, if he were an Arab in Egypt, without that level of proficiency in Arabic, he could get into a university and study medicine in Arabic. So why is it that you can't study medicine in Arabic in Nigeria? Or history, or political science, or economics? It happens in the Arab world. Why is it that an Arab who knows how to read and write Arabic is considered literate? An Arab who has studied um, Islamic law is considered educated, but a Nigerian who ha does that outside the formal English schooling system is not. How is it possible for a Chinese to be a doctor without speaking English? But apparently in Nigeria it's not possible. And, and, and you know, so, so we're dealing, with, we're dealing with, with, with an entire system and a worldview that while we think it's Nigerian, it's actually nothing but a colonial legacy. We're still in a post-colonial, neo-colonial mindset, and we are unwilling to challenge the legacies of colonialism. And it takes courage, I think, to begin to ask those questions. 
how do you turn the six centuries of Islamic teaching and learning and contact with the Arab world through trans-Saharan trade and the caravans and through exchange of ideas? How do you turn that into an asset rather than a liability? Because at the moment, the Muslims of the Northwest and the Northeast are a liability to this country. They're poor, they're marginalized, their education has no value, they're frustrated, and they are susceptible at this point in time to being um, co-opted into agendas that are not even theirs. It's not just Northern Nigeria, it's the whole of the Sahel. It's a problem that we need to deal with. A few weeks ago, the, sorry, this is prayer time in Nigeria. Okay, so a few weeks ago, the French president uh, was in, I think, Mali, and an interesting uh, meeting with about five West African he heads of state on the Sahel. And, and at, the end, at the end of that meeting, what were they talking about? How many more French troops you're going to have? How many soldiers each country was going to have? I was waiting to see how, look, how many million euro was France going to invest in education in the Sahel? Uh, what, what, what agricultural policies were you going to have? How many megawatts? How do you turn all the solar energy in the Sahel into power for industries, uh, for development? No one is talking about that. You're talking about how many bullets you're going to have, how many terrorists you're going to shoot. It does not address the problem. So, um, so when, when we speak about culture, and so it's precisely that insulation from modernity, the level of the education, first of all, that um, deprived the bulk of the north of Western education while stopping the progress of Islamic education has left the northwest and northeast of Nigeria locked in the past, and that is the truth. Civilizationally and culturally, they have been delinked from the rest of the Muslim world. So many of the issues you deal with in Nigeria today, we're still talking about regulating the age of marriage. Look, Egypt <laughs> regulated the age of marriage in the 1950s. Most Muslim countries, Egypt, Malaysia, Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco, you can't go and marry a girl of 12. It's illegal. And even those countries that have not made it illegal have put in such strict guidelines that if you want to marry a girl below 15 or 16 or 17 or 18, depending on the age, you will need the approval of a judge who would make sure that the girl is old enough to take on the role of a wife and a mother. But that conversation in Nigeria today has just started, and it is a very difficult one to have. Most of these countries have understood that you've got to regulate polygamy. Nobody says outlaw it, nobody says prohibit it, but clearly um, the Islamic law and Islamic jurisprudence has always had um, underlying um, the permissibility of polygamy, also responsibility that you've got to take. The rights of children. Okay, to education, to care. You can't just give birth to a child and leave him on the street for the set to take care of. You can't just produce children you cannot take care of. And now these are basic conversations that have taken place for decades in the Muslim world, which have not taken place in Nigeria. So you, on the one hand, the North was not given Western education, on the other hand, its progress in terms of understanding its own religion and the, this process of ijtihad, of, of coming up with new rulings um, for changing times has been stopped. And you therefore have a whole generation of experts and generations and generations of experts who are experts on 15th century Muslim jurisprudence and they think all the questions that we need have been answered. Five, uh, five, and are we doing the new answers? Now, until we address this issue of um, what's our attitude to the education of our girls, 
what's our attitude to uh, the age at which a girl should be a wife and a mother? What's our attitude to spacing children? What's our attitude to polygamy? What's our attitude to responsibility as a parent? And these are all issues of Islamic jurisprudence that um, have, to be, have to be used to confront culture. And again, um, some part of the mistake that people have made in the past is to come to, to people and say, well, you know, this is United Nations resolution. Well, you know, they, know they, never, they, they don't care about the United Nations. It's not, it's not an argument. The UN is not an argument. But the truth is, um, for, for I mean, and then there are those of you who are, I mean, Moshir is, is a scholar of, um, of Sharia. I, I mean, Imam Malik talked about 18 as the age of marriage. And so did Abu Hanifa, and so did Amr ibn Hanbal. Yes, Shafi'i said 15. So out of the four Sunni schools, three of the Imams actually at one time mentioned 18 when they talked about age of marriage. But you say 18 today, and it's seen as a United Nations agenda. So we, we, uh, being able to argue from within the tradition, using the Quran and the Hadith and the Jewish, and also the work of other Muslim countries is important. But you can't do that until we continue, until we begin the process of opening up that civilization and uh, relinking um, the, um, the, 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 the jurisprudence and the scholarship to the international scholarship on Islam. So, so culture and cultural practices, uh, to my mind, have led to this demographic implosion. They've, um, and that has um, contributed to the levels of poverty and development, and they will continue to, to do so until we go and address the roots. If, if you're a governor in, in a state in northern Nigeria today and you're told you've got 250,000 children um, who are going to school, I assure you by the time you build the classrooms for them, there will be another 500,000 waiting. I mean, we, you know, we have in the northeast and northwest, and, and this is why th this conversation is important. We have gone through a process of commodification of the people. We, we, we've, we've had this mass production of human beings and, and devalue them at the same time. So if you think about the present and the future, what would I say are the, are the key things we need to look at? Apart from, of course, the, I can go on with the standard um, economic arguments. I've made all the arguments against the rentier state about um, the, uh, and, and rent seeking, by the way, continues in different guises it, it, with one, one government or other. It's, it's, it's either in the currency markets or in the petroleum sector until we deal with that as a nation, we're not going to have the development we want. So we can talk about the general economic culture of the country, um, the, the rent-seeking state, the, um, the corruption, the, the lack of focus on, on industry. In, in a sense, the continuation of even on the economic level, just, just as we've done at the cultural level, of, of this, of this uh, colonial project. I mean, Nigeria is a country that I always say um, it's, it's special in that we, we, we export uh, what we don't have and we import what we have. You know, uh, I mean, look, why should Nigeria import petroleum products? But, and, but, the, but the, I mean, if you, if you take the trade between Nigeria and the United Kingdom, the largest single component of Nigerian imports from Britain and from France is petroleum products. We're keeping refineries in Europe open and exporting our crude. We burn our gas and we don't have electricity. And by the way, even though we don't have electricity, we do export electricity to Niger. <laughs> you know, we have all these hides and skin and we import shoes from China. We have a large cotton belt. Our textiles are all dead. We import fabric from the Far East. We import plastic made from petrochemicals, and we're an oil-producing country. And by the way, China is, not, China is a net importer of crude oil. So they buy our crude oil, and they're able to turn it into petrochemicals and sell us plastics.
you know, we have height and skin. Uh, what do we do with our height and skin? Pepper soup. <laughs> we consume it. We consume. It's a delicacy in some parts of the country. And that's GDP. Other countries, you know, I mean, as far back as um, the 16th, 15th century, according to economic historians, Kano was exporting leather and bags and shoes to Morocco, to India. Today we don't. We export with blue. You know, we're so good at this, we even had a military government that conducted a free and fair election in Liberia. You know, and, 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 it's, and, it's, and it's, it's sad because you, you had this, and if you go back before this crisis, we had a country that was growing, GDP growing at 7%. Imagine at what rate Nigeria would grow if we stopped importing petroleum products and stopped all these subsidy schemes and swaps and all that, which every day we, we're still hearing of, which cost me my job, by the way. Uh, if we stopped all of that and just refined our petroleum products and became a net exporter of petroleum products, if we stopped importing three million pairs of shoes from China and started producing our own shoes and bags, and I'm not talking about uh, Yves Saint Laurent or Pierre Cardin or Gucci, I'm talking about simple shoes that children wear to school, <coughs> that people wear to farms, handbags, for the woman in the village. I'm not talking about um, synthetic, expensive leather. By the way, the goat skin in Kano is called Moroccan leather. It's the best leather. But we don't do anything with it. All the refineries are gone. For a country of 170 million people, we generate at a peak today a little over 4,000 megawatts of electricity. You know, that is not 4,000 megawatts 24 by 7. If in a month you get to 4,000 megawatts for one minute, you say you've produced 4,000 megawatts in June. How do you re-industrialize? So we, we've had a process of deindustrialization. So, so, so tell me, if you had an imperialist power in Nigeria, if Britain were today in charge of Nigerian government. Can they have it any better? <laughs> buy my crude, sell you petroleum products. Buy your cotton, sell you textiles. Buy your heights and skin, give you fancy shoes to wear. Sell you private jets. Was this not what colonialism was about? Was this not what they came and fought and sought? Was this not what it was all about? They had stopped slavery, so they didn't come for the slaves. This was what they came for. We're giving them for free, 60 years after they left. So, I don't know if what I say, uh, because I'm also processing still in my mind as I, as I go along these things, um, but the long and short of it, I, I think, is um, I have come to the sad conclusion that we are all still products of colonialism. And we are yet to free ourselves economically, socially, and culturally. And we need to go back. For the Muslim North, there has to be a recognition that history has brought Nigeria together, and you're part of this country, and you've got to respect the diversity of the country. But also have the confidence to insist that your history cannot be written off. It cannot be wiped out by 60 years of colonialism. We will sit side by side. We will speak English and speak Arabic. And we will be a part of a country that recognizes that it has brought people with history that has flowed from different parts of the world. Economics, we've got to realize that so long as we continue producing raw materials and exporting, uh, we are still in a post-colonial mindset. We're still doing what the Greeks want. We've got to do what the Southeast Asian countries did for themselves. And it's not just about Europe. 
I wrote an article in 2012 on China, and it was a very unpopular article. People thought I was being ungrateful to Chinese for all the help they've done to us. <laughs> and I tried to explain that, you know, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter whether it's British or American or Chinese, if I'm exporting raw materials and importing finished products, I am in a trading relationship that will end up changing terms of trade against me, and I'm in a colonial or quasi-colonial relationship. What we have to do to China is what China did to Europe. Take away the manufacturing from China. And I'm not talking about competing with the Chinese or selling to Europeans, we don't need to. You've got a country of 170 million people. That's enough market. For, look at Adiko Dangote, he's not exporting. He's the richest man in Africa, selling to Nigerians. Cement, flour, sugar. So just add to the list, shoes, bags, fabric, textiles, garments, slippers. Don't go into producing. Well, nobody says go and compete with aerospace. We're not interested in that. But basic industrialization, basic agro-processing. Look, just stop importing rice from Thailand to start with, you know, and produce the rice next door. Or stop eating rice. If you can't produce it, eat corn, eat maize, eat wheat, eat what you produce. And this is precisely how those countries that broke away uh, from poverty did. Um, so um, would you find this in this paper, maybe one or two sentences out of this somewhere in there? <laughs> uh, but uh, um, I, 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 I'm, I'm hoping that I've just try to share some thoughts and maybe through the q and I'll get an idea of what you'd like to talk about if I can talk about it. And I think it would be best uh, at this point to, to stop here and thank you for your attention. Ladies and gentlemen, I think you'll all agree with me that was an absolutely stirring and wonderful uh, presentation. Absolutely! There are many profound things were said and they're very understated, but for that very reason, very, very powerful as well. So I greatly enjoyed it. I think that what we should do is immediately take me out of the equation except to recognize your hands for questions. Uh, the young lady down here, please. Okay, Barca de Zua. Um, you talked about um, polygamy um, and the fact that a lot of people have kids and don't know how to take care of them. So I want to talk a little bit about, the, about patriarchy and poverty and the cycle there. So in northern Nigeria, there's a saying, if you're poor, that you should have add another wife. And that's kind of um, a common belief amongst people. So an issue is um, you have the patriarchy kind of perpetuating this narrative that that's the way forward. So a lot of people don't really understand what marriage is and they just see it as long as I marry a wife and I'm keeping her at home, I've done my duty, even when it comes to kids. Um, and you've mentioned about young girls getting married off quite young. Um, and the fact of the matter is, often the people that do that are those who have the money to kind of bribe the parents and say, I want your daughter um, hand in marriage. And often it's because they're poor and they don't really have much of a choice, they can't afford her schooling, that they think that's the best way forward to marry her off. Um, you've also mentioned um, that there are, there's a gap in terms of social policy. So 
what would you advise in terms of the absence of government, in terms of providing policies where people have access to education and healthcare? Um, that's kind of pushing people to join extremist groups or marry off their young daughters. What can Nigerians do um, in terms of bridging that gap in the absence of government? Because even if you do provide, if you do um, encourage people to have less children, they still might have that barrier to access to jobs where if they don't know the right people, they're still left in poverty. So they don't, they're still left without much of a choice. So what would you advise in that circumstance? Thank you. Okay. Um, well, first of all, I think that um, there are many things that really point to the failure of the state. I mean, it's, this is very simple. If you give birth to a child and the child is found on the street, you're responsible. Someone has to say, this is your son. And if you go to Islamic law, the father is responsible for the maintenance of his child. And if he's poor, if he has a son who can do it, he does that. If he has a brother, there's a whole um, um, sequence of wilaya. And it is only when no member of your family or one of those on whom responsibility has been placed by the Sharia is capable of taking care of your child that that burden falls on society. So we simply saying implement what is already in the law. If you have a child, you have a responsibility for that child. Right now, the children are treated as criminals. They did not produce themselves. Okay, so that's one. So you've got the issue of failure of the state. And, and this cuts across many things. And, and I, can, I can understand politicians have a problem because they sometimes they have a conflict between what is right and what is popular. The truth is they need to do some of the things that are right that are not popular and other parts of the world did it. So if it is determined that it is harmful to a girl that she be married below a certain age, it is the responsibility of the state to say you cannot marry of your daughter below that age, period. Okay, now, if, if, I, if I could do the law in Kano, I would have made the law to say you cannot marry of your daughter below a certain age. Now, if you feel your religion or your interpretation of religion says that you can marry her off below that age, well, go somewhere else and marry her off, but not in my state. And this is really where I think the political authorities take responsibility. Now, part of what we try to do is to help them by having a conversation, by having people begin to accept. And the truth is that the vast majority of people understand that. I was having a conversation with someone yesterday who said, um, or, or this morning, who said, you, you've had a lot of resistance. I said, well, you can sometimes be carried away by noise from the establishment. Because the truth is that there are a number of scholars who know that everything said here is true and that this is not Islam but culture. That if you go down to the village, if there's a woman whose daughter has been married off at a young age and who's suffering from VVF and sitting right in front of her, she understands that this is wrong. If there's a woman who's not being taken care of by her husband, who's been divorced um, for doing nothing or because there are no regulations around divorce. You know, people just wake up and say, I divorce you, you've got four or five children, you go, and they leave you with, the, with that burden. Many women in Nigeria have either been in that situation or know people who are in that situation, and they understand that these things need to change. And there's a very large number of Muslims that, um, frankly, they do feel uncomfortable with this, but they don't have enough understanding of the law, so they think it's actually Islam. And so they're very happy to hear that this is actually not religion but culture. So I would say that this change is not going to be as difficult as you think, but we've got to deal with it. But, th but the other side to your argument, which is true, is that it's not just um, a culture of an understanding of religion, there's also poverty. So if you tell a poor man in a village, wait until your daughter is 16, and you don't have a school in the village, what then happens? Which is why, again, we've got to think out of the box a number of things. One of the things I've talked about is the use of mosques for schools. Um, and please, if there's any Nigerian journalist here, tell me so that I know how to say this five times so that I don't get the kind of mis misrepresentations I had the last time. Um, now, if you look at a geospatial map of Kano, you would probably see 20 mosques before you see a school. 
But if you go to Muslim history, mosques were, were never just buildings for prayers. I mean, these were the mosques were schools, mosques were places where you had political meetings, mosques were places where um, uh, rulers uh, were, were, were crowned or, um, uh, or appointed and so on. If you go to Fas in Morocco, the university is in the mosque. The great university of Al-Azhar, they're all in the mosque. No, no, not in every part of northern Nigeria, but in the traditional mosques, yes. But now you've got a number of mosques being built with, with sections uh, for women. Uh, I think most of the modern structures do have um, uh, uh, places for, for women. But that's still just for prayer. But the point I'm making is if you have a mosque, then you have a school. There's no reason why you can't bring teachers and students to learn in the mosque. It's just what happens all over the Muslim world. Why is it not happening in our part of the Muslim world? Why do you need to have money to build a primary school or tell or exclude a child from primary education because his parents cannot afford transportation to primary school when there's a mosque next door? Now, when I said that, uh, I think the headlines were that I said all mosques should be converted to schools, okay? And I, I, somehow, I don't know how they got to that interpretation, but, but uh, everything got buried in, um, in that. But, but that's the point. So you've got to think out of the box in terms of converting, um, basically, like I said, so you've got this civilization that's produced all these mosques. These mosques can be an asset. You can use the mosque as a primary school. You can use the mosque as secondary school. You can, you can use the mosque as a hospital if you want and then clean it up for prayer. So you don't need to start construction. Bring the teachers, bring internet, internet connectivity, bring some solar power, bring some um, uh, some tablets and you, you'll be amazed what kind of education you can take to a rural area, okay, for the, for the cost of brick and mortar uh, for a school. Um, so that's it. If, so you've got to deal with education, deal with, deal with poverty. Uh, build the schools, um, and then you need all these foundations and the private sector support. People need to give scholarships. People need to support children. This is how the Turks did. They had foundations. I mean, uh, Suleiman, Suleiman the Magnificent had these great foundations attached to mosques that sponsored poor children and gave them education, and we need to do more of that. Gentlemen in the front here. Well, uh, I can understand where the uh, Emir is coming from. It's more or less of the less of firebrand it used to be in those days, but I can understand. Now, he's complaining about marginalization of the North. The Yorubas complain of marginalization. The Nigerians compl complain of the same. There's this idea of Biafra. And I ask, who is marginalizing who? So maybe Nigeria is actually marginalizing itself. And uh, so that's one point. Secondly, uh, the basic solution, I think, well, we've talked about engaging the imams because they still control a lot of uh, audience and attention in Nigeria. And people now ask that, okay, all these issues we have analyzed, what is the way forward? The political class has filled the nation and uh, the, the elites, of course, it serves their interests. So what will be the basic things? We can't be complaining about colonialism after 60 years or so of independence any longer. And uh, so the th thing now is how do we move forward to solve all those big issues? That's uh, part one. Part two is that, which has to do with uh, the Emma himself. The Hausa program in Suez is dying or dead, I wouldn't know. And of, of course, also the Yoruba, that's the issue I read this morning. What we need is intervention in this regard to ensure that those positions for African languages, of course, are equally restored. Thank you very much. Um, may I clarify that I did not complain about no the North being marginalized. I, I talked about the um, actual conditions of poverty I see in the North and tried to understand what brought them about and how we can deal with them. I know because you've got these, um, you know, in Nigeria, marginalization is a term that's a very useful political one. Um, and, and when people say they're marginalized, usually they just mean they haven't seen enough ministers uh, from their local government in Abuja. Uh, which is, again, it goes back to this um, distorted sense of what development is. I mean, why do I care if I have 10 ministers in Abuja from Kano? 
how does that affect the number of women who die in childbirth? Or the number of children who are not in school? Why, why do I care that the Minister of Agriculture should be from a particular part of the country? How does that affect the productivity of our culture where I live? I, I think we need to, I mean, a lot of the debate, and that, that's why I think when, when, I, when I say these things, I say some of the discussion is, is to me so vacuous. We talk about restructuring Nigeria. I have not heard a single Northern politician talk about the 500 years of Northern history that has been erased. This is far, far more important than how much, you, how you share resources, oil money from month to month, which is what people are talking about. And we've all been sucked into this debate of marginalization, which happens every four years, a different part of the country is marginalized. Okay, so when you have a southern government, the northerners say we're marginalized. You have a northern government, southerners say we're marginalized. And you say, in what way? Jonathan was from the Niger Delta. How much investment did he put in the Niger Delta? By how much did it improve? So we need to get out of that conversation. I'm not, I am not in that marginalization conversation. And by the way, I, I don't even think of myself as a northern, I'm an Amir, but, but I, I think we've got to go beyond that, I think, of the country. But if you've got this large population, um, and this population is poor, it's uneducated, it's frustrated, you're not going to have stability and development until you address that. Um, and, and I think these are some of the issues that we need to look at. So on, on what we need to do, again, I don't blame the British. I don't, I've never blamed them. I think they, they did what they needed to do um, as a colonial administration. We, 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 we did this all to ourselves after they left. And that's the problem. We might, they, might have, they might have as well stayed, you know, because for, for all intents and purposes, they couldn't have done as much more damage than they've done, than we've done to ourselves. And I think we need to um, get to that level of maturity where we see 60 years of British intervention, or I mean, maybe less. Nigeria was amalgamated in 1914 independent in 1960, 46 years. We've been independent now for over 50, we've been independent for longer than the British were there. We can't blame the British. Not that they don't deserve blame, they do. But we can't hold them, you know, uh, and uh, responsible for what we did to ourselves, you know. So for me, I think it's if, if we choose to forget all our history, if we choose to, to produce raw materials for them after they've gone and, and keep their refineries open and import their goods, that's our decision. And we've got to fix that. Your Excellency. Well, on, on, on the... On the house of thin, I thought Professor Badering, you'd sent me a quiet email that we we're going to discuss this evening. Is that uh, uh, so? I, uh, to the extent that I have not even entered that conversation, I'm not able to say uh, what I can. But but I but I hear your point, and I think we need to do everything we can to keep um, um, house of studies and university so alive. Your Excellency, I humbly would like to give thanks and praise for your presence and your wisdom. My question is, is there a critical mass of leaders in Nigeria who broadly think like you, who can come together to strategize and activate the decolonization program you have, you have so brilliantly articulated? You know, when, when in 1999, 2000, one of the states in Nigeria announced it was going to implement Sharia, I got involved in that debate. 
And when I started, um, initially I thought I was alone. Um, when the debate continued, I realized that there were very many people who believed exactly what I believed, just didn't want to be the ones to come out and say it, okay? Um, my sense is that if you, well, one, you should never be afraid of being a minority. Even a minority of one, uh, you should try to um, have the courage of your convictions. And then if you're in a leadership position, um, as um, Marcus already said, and you're given the choice between what is right and what is popular, you must do what is right. And you can never go wrong with that. I don't think there's anyone that as long as you continue to have a conversation, will not accept that there's something wrong with taking a go. I mean, look, we talk about Boko Haram. Uh, one, one of the speeches I gave at Bring Back Our Girls is, we talk about what Boko Haram did to the Chibok girls. Okay, they took girls out of school, um, kidnapped them, forced them into marriage, you know, um, made them mothers. And we all horrified. Now, that is the horror we should feel at what happens every single day. A girl's parents or uncles take her out of school, force her into marriage without her will, and turn her into a mother. It's exactly the same thing. They just didn't hold a gun to her head. And so long as we do have that human sense of this must be wrong, ultimately, there will be a large army of people who will get up, and the women themselves will get up and say, we've had enough of it. And this is how society changes. What I'm happy about, I mean, I've, I've not made as much progress as I had hoped I would on this cultural change thing. I've met perhaps far stiffer resistance from certain quarters than I thought um, I would get. But there is a conversation today in Northern Nigeria about child marriage in, of a type we never had before. There's a conversation around polygamy. There's a conversation around um, the almajiris and, and the role of parents and, and the rights of children. There's a conversation around contraception and child spacing. I mean, there was a time when to open this conversation, you would just be accused of pursuing some Judeo-Christian colonial agenda against Islam, and, and, th and that's it. Today, you've got people who start to say, no, you know, this is something that has to stop. So I think um, we will get there. Um, as a country, we, we've had many false starts. Uh, we've had high hopes that have been dashed. Um, but I'm a strong believer uh, in, in this country and what we can do, and I think we can. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm not Nigerian, not even West African, but what I heard today is probably the best speech given by an African leader for a very, very long time. So. Uh, regarding uh, exporting what um, we don't have and importing what we have, this is an African disease. We do it everywhere. And I think that's going to take us a long time to overcome. But my question to you is uh, what I find really heartbreaking is this idea of having so many educated kids which are seen completely worthless because they have the wrong kind of knowledge, the wrong kind of language. And that's really devastating because uh, any, any child that's a learner of the Quran by heart um, is a, an incredibly intelligent child that can advance the whole society. Is there something you can do and your colleagues could, could do as leaders of the North to introduce maybe secular Arab, uh, Arabic-based education universities to be open in the north? Thank you. Let me take a brief uh, ask question because we're running out of time very shortly. But in the following order, uh, the young lady in the front here has two two months of bread and the one of the spice. Uh, <laughs> at the back there. So Thank you. It's always a, a great pleasure to be referred to as a young lady. Um, 
Thank you very much for, for, for the lecture. I just have two quick questions. And one is really to return to a central argument you've made throughout your entire presentation around dismantling patriarchy. You've not talked about it in that way, but my understanding of it is that's what you're speaking about. I just want you to clarify for me a bit of a slippage that I hear, because you speak about the importance of centering girls' education, the importance of dealing with sexual and reproductive health rights questions for women and girls, but anchoring that within a sort of Islamic understanding of responsibilities and rights, which, as you spoke earlier, still places women and girls under a sort of uh, control, yes, guardianship. Could you just clarify how does that approach, and I totally hear the thing about situating conversations in a language and a framework that people will hear. But how does that move us away from this cycle of patriarchal control, which, you know, saying if it's not the man who can take care of it, it's the uncle, it's the son, it's the brother, you know, continuing this patrilineal uh, approach. The second question is around this thing we hear a lot, around the Asian tigers, Africa needing to model itself around that, which is fundamentally around the developmental state model, right? And, we've see, and, and we know, you know, that that is deeply reliant on a very strong uh, central command, if you will, uh, quasi-authoritarian model, if you will. How, how much of, of, of looking to the Asian Tigers do we need to do in 2017? You know, what, what models of the developmental state do we need to fashion for ourselves? Because we've seen, for instance, what has happened in Ethiopia post Melis, right? You know, the Roma struggles and all of that. So ca can we have a conversation in 2017 that moves us beyond the Asian Tigers and Africa needing to look to that model as a way to move forward? Thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm using something that you said as a jumping off point for an issue that you didn't necessarily touch on directly, which is the issue of the thousands and thousands of young African children who are dying in the Mediterranean every month. Um, in, in the last two years, it's become inc increasingly horrible. And um, a lot of those young people are from northern Nigeria. And I like that you mentioned um, your dislike for the militarization of the response to, over-militarization of the response to Boko Haram and to terrorism in the Sahel. But part of that is now we're seeing this increasing militarization or securitization of the response to African migration and mobility. And um, one of the things that stands out to me is, how do we get African leaders to take more responsibility for the number of young African children who are dying in the Mediterranean today, from your perspective, as an as a leader uh, in a in a country, you know, in a space, in a in a territory that is sort of implicated in this process. Uh, in light of the recent comment by the president of France about Africa having some civilizational problems and blaming that for the state of affairs in the co on the continent. Uh, you mentioned the fact that Nigeria is a very diverse country. It's not a nation, uh, for sure. Uh, there's a lot of diversity of you know, uh, linguistic, religious, ethnic diversity. Um, how do you see, I mean, uh, but what makes Nigeria a political unit? Or what makes Nigeria a nation? If it is, if it is one, uh, and do you do, do you see any alternative other than Western liberal values of democracy or human rights, civic ideals of nationalism and citizenship? Beyond these ideals of citizenship, do you see any ideals from existing Nigerian organic civilizations that can unite? Uh, Nigeria as a nation, or that can serve as an overarching identity of being a Nigerian. Thanks. Okay, yeah, some of these questions are very tough, aren't they? <laughs> um, yes, on the first, I, I think it's 
I, 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 basically, that was my point, okay? So if you go back to, to the 1940s, um, my great-grandfather in Kano, uh, Bayero, set, set up what was called the Judicial School. It was an attempt to have Western and Islamic education in one compound. And to this day, people talk about integration, and that's what they're talking about. Okay, you have a school where you can study English, math, history, French, and, uh, or whatever, you know, study this in English, and then you've got um, Quran, Hadith, Fiqh, and so on in Arabic. Now, my proposal is, let's do what the Arab nations do. If you go to the University of Cairo today, and you want to study medicine, you have the option of study medicine in English or study medicine in Arabic. You know, so why, what is wrong with mainstreaming? And in fact, beyond Arabic, why shouldn't we aim for a situation where you study medicine in Hausa? You know why? why, why, why if you learned medicine in Hausa, are you, is it that you cannot do the operation because you are taught in Hausa? Do you need, you, you know, I mean, so it's, it's about basically asking simple questions. Why does it have to be English? Why? Uh, why? Why am I seen as more educated than someone because I speak better English? And the further my accent away is away from the Nigerian accent, the more educated apparently I am. You know. So I mean, we need to get out out of that. And I think it's by having I don't I don't know the answers. I would say, look, education is on the concurrent list. That means states have certain flexibility in how they formulate education policy, even though there's a national curriculum delegate some of that to the states. If Kano feels that for schools built by the Kano state government and for the secondary schools in Kano and for the universities owned by Kano state, they want to offer economics and political science and history and medicine and engineering to students who have shown a certain level of proficiency in Arabic. Okay, maybe after going through some a, a conversion courses, you know, on basic, you know, let them do it. And then set the standards. And that way, at least you begin to mainstream them and take them out of the margins, okay? Right now, what happens is they invest so much in education because, look, you have, you, you just about the value. If, if a, ch a child who memorizes the Quran, for him, this is a great achievement. And yet, in that society, it's nothing. Because it can get him nowhere. It can't even get him into year seven. It's not the equivalent of a pri primary school certificate. Now, that child is frustrated. That child feels this society has treated him unfairly. And that child ends up in the hands of someone who says, you know what, this society is an infidel society. It has no respect for the Quran and for God. You, you, what you need to do is go and fight against it. And that's how you get all these children suicide bombers. And, and I really think we've got to, uh, to deal with that. Which gets me to the uh, question on militarization. I, it look, a military and security solution are essential. You, there's no way you can have a group of people with guns and bombs coming at you without a military solution. The point I'm making is that the military solution is not the be all and end all. And beyond dealing with it, I look at look at Iraq, look at Afghanistan, look at Palestine. You can win a war, but at the end of the day, you've got to win the peace. You've got to make sure that what we had with Boko Haram does not happen again. But if you continue having all these children who are not going to school, if you continue showing up the per capita income numbers you have, the unemployment numbers you have, the youth, the ideal youth numbers that you have, um, the very bad social policies that you have, you're going to have something else. It may not be Boko Haram, it'll be, it'll be something else. Look at the Niger Delta. Look at these um, IPOB people that, who, want, who want Biafra. It's, these are just signs of frustrations, you know, by, by young people. It's really by young people. Let me give you another number. You have a country of 170 million people. 
take a guess, what's the median age in Nigeria? Median age today? It's 19. It's 19. In, in the next 20 years, you're going to have 85 million Nigerians between the ages of 20 and 40. That is more than the population of Germany, the third largest economy in the world. Think about it. On what economy are you going to sustain them? And if you think the Biafra war and Boko Haram and Fulani herdsmen are a crisis, think of the crisis we would have when we have 80 million youth unemployed. You know, so d don't, anyone who thinks that because you've defeated Boko Haram, you've solved the problem, you know? All those young ones, you know, uh, the, the toddlers that are around, all those young ones are going to grow up into a far more vicious um, uh, a Boko Haram. So you've got to deal with, you've got to think, okay, where did we go wrong? And how do we make sure we don't go wrong with the next generation? Uh, this is, I think, for me, uh, for me the point. Um, um, the young lady. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I wish I could claim that I was advocating for dismantling patriarchy. Unfortunately, I'm not that progressive. Um, uh, uh, not that I, I think it's wrong. I mean, if you, I'm always happy my daughter, my daughter, I have a daughter who says I'm a fraud, that, that people think I'm progressive, um, I'm liberal, you know, and that they should ask her. She says, three years after I've been an Amir, I don't have a single woman in my Emirates Council. I have done nothing to show that I'm ready to have women become Amirs, you know, and as far as she's concerned, I'm just a slightly refined um, <laughs> um, <laughs> model. At the moment. So, so the next generation is worse. No, I, I think that, um, I think that it's it's very difficult to totally and and, and look I, I don't I don't have any moral issue with having a patrilineal or patriarchal or matrilineal system. I think at the end of the day, um, things have to work and things have to work within a certain logic. So take even take the simple issue of child marriage. Okay, when we're growing up, it was very normal to have a girl of twelve or thirteen get married to an older man who had other wives. And she would be married, she would be taken to his house, and she would be treated more or less like a daughter. Okay, clothed and fed and taken care of. And then when she's of age 17, 18, she becomes a wife in that sense. Okay, even Islamic jurisprudence makes a distinction between the age of marriage and the age of conservation. And there's actually, a, there's actually criminal punishment for consummating marriage with a girl who is not ready for consummation. It's, it's in the law. I mean, people just don't, don't use it. Now, you fast forward to, the, to, to this century or, and, and this decade, and people marry 12, 13-year-old girls without any kind of knowledge of that logic, of that patriarchal structure. Okay, and people have talked about the bargain of patriarchy anyway. Uh, you, you know that more than I, where women sometimes give up some of their rights to equality in response, in, in return for the protection they get from the husband or the father or the brother. Now that is part of the logic of a patriarchal system. Where, you, where things go wrong is when all the men take all the privileges of patriarchy without any of the responsibilities. In a patriarchal system, you would be ashamed to see that your son is a beggar. You want your son to be something. In a patriarchal system, you'd be ashamed to see that your wife has to go out to beg someone for food. That is not patriarchy, this is just injustice. You know, so let us at least start, <laughs> start with that. And maybe after we've resolved the issues of child marriage, domestic violence, we can start talking about dismantling patriarchy. And uh, I, I can assure you that when it begins, the revolution will begin from my own house. You know, there are quite a number of uh, people who are ready, who are ready to overthrow me. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, okay, so now on, the, on, the, on this question of um, the developmental state, 
you know, there are the, the, the things that have worked and there are things that haven't worked. And if you look at, yes, you've had a few cases of countries that have gone through um, or leapfrogged certain stages of development. But one thing we know as economists, and we have known since the 1950s with structural economics, is that there is no way you are ever going to develop if you continue to rely on primary exports. This is something that's work, that, that we know. Okay, so we had the Industrial Revolution in Europe, we had it in the United States. We've had Asian countries who've gone through that process and they've moved themselves out of poverty. Um, I, I, there's an interesting book about Nigeria and Indonesia growing apart. You can see clearly what they did that we didn't do. And you can see all the potential that Nigeria has with all the resources that we have, just like, and I keep saying, just, just imagine it. Just imagine if instead of burning all this gas, you produce electricity. Nigeria is 60, 60 65% of the population in West Africa. It's 50% of West African GDP. It has a captive market next door. Without going outside its borders, it has 170 million people. How many pairs of shoes is that? How many bags? How many shirts? You know? How many kilowatts of electricity? How many gallons of water? Purified water? How many bottles of Coca-Cola? I mean, just think of it. It's, it's simple. I mean, for me, it's... And that's why I'm so confident that the day Nigeria gets it, this is, this is history, it's just that one thing, you know, that, that, that hasn't clicked, you know. So I, I, would, I would say do not reinvent the wheel. Just do what they did, and we can do it. And Ethiopia, by the way, is something, Meles is one person that showed what could be done. I mean, take what he did with coffee. You know, he said, look, I'm tired of my farmers getting only 10% of the value of their coffee, okay? Got the IFC, got Starbucks, trained coffee farmers, by the time he was through, Ethiopian farmers were getting 65% of the value. And you would go to a Starbucks shop and drink coffee that came straight out of, a, out of Ethiopia without going through another country. You didn't have to go to Brazil for airing and drying and whatever. You know? And when you think that the term coffee came from a region of Ethiopia, Kaffa, it is so sad. You know, it's almost um, a no-brainer that Ethiopia should do that with coffee. But it's not just coffee. Look. Look at cement. He called Dangote, come and produce cement here. I'll give you free electricity. Brought down the cost of cement by 40, 50%. Construction boom. He told the Chinese, I'm tired of selling wet blue to you and importing shoes. Come and produce the shoes and gloves. Right now, outside Addis, there's a big shop producing shoes and gloves, exporting to the United States under Agoa. And Ethiopia grew at double digit, 11, 12% year after year. I was governor of Central Bank. I was green with envy. I was, you know, I was, I was telling my government, look, look at Ethiopia. Th just do a little bit of that. Look, Lagos is 30% of Nigeria's non-all GDP. If Lagos grows by 10%, that is Nigeria's non-all GDP growing by 3%. What does it take to grow Lagos by 10%? A deep sea port? An expanded airport? some rail line to remove the traffic. You know, so we'll get there, don't worry. I, 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 have, no, I have no doubt. The final point is about the French, uh, the French president said what? Something about Africa having? Well, that, th that's, uh, that's rich coming from the French. Um, <laughs> I mean, I mean, look, Oh, look, who doesn't have a civilizational problem? Is it, is it leadership? I mean, so where is, the, where is the role modeling coming from? Is it America with Donald Trump or <laughs> Russia with Putin? You know, where, where is the role modeling coming from? Uh, you know, people need to stop pronouncing these judgments on other cultures and civilizations and look inwards. I can say a lot about French, about the French. I am, I, I'm going to Paris tomorrow, I don't want to be rude. Um, <laughs> But, but no, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't listen to him. But I, but I, th I think that um, 
one of the greatest problems uh, of the world or, or in, with some people is that they're so quick to pronounce judgments uh, on things they don't understand. I've heard people talk about Muslims and, and they, they, they don't think about Islam at all or, or about blacks or about Americans. Uh, the truth is you've got to uh, be able to identify the particular individual or the particular issue they have an issue with and discuss. And we need to understand that the 21st century world, like every other world, is a world that has many cultures and civilizations, all of which deserve to be respected. And um, we should, first of all, respect ourselves and then demand respect from everyone else. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, His Highness drove three hours from Brighton to get here because of traffic jams. So we're going to bring this formal part of the discussions to a close so he can relax a little bit with you at a reception and I'm sure he'll be very happy to talk on a one-to-one -one basis uh, with you before we go off to solve the problems of Hauser at SOAS. But I think we're all agreed that we've listened to some words of wisdom tonight and I think that we should all thank the Emir from the depths of our being for his coming, for his talking so well, and imparting his wisdom to us. Ladies and gentlemen.